really happy to welcome my friend Monica Prince, who is going to talk to you or perhaps perform at you about performance. So I'm going to get off stage. What do you need? I do a USB. You need a USB. Wait, we're going to find that first. Uh, make sure you can see it. This is this one. Okay. All right. My name is Monica Prince. I teach at Susquehanna University in Seals Grove, Pennsylvania, which is roughly 300 miles away from here. Um, I teach activist and performance writing, which is why I'm going to give you all a performance workshop. So a performance workshop is essentially how do you, how do you present your work to the public? That's, that's basically what we're doing. It's called Say It With Your Chest, partially because it's a joke from Kevin Hart, but also because, yeah, you got me, <laughs> mostly because uh, the experience of performing is about like using your whole body and saying it from here, meaning saying it with your heart, right? So that's why it's called say it with your chest. We're gonna have a great time. Whether you perform poetry or you sing or you perform prose, nonfiction, fiction, uh, sci-fi, fantasy, short stories, long excerpts, all that jazz, this is the workshop for you. Are you ready? Excellent. Your interaction is, is mandatory for this experience. You too, Zoom. Don't disappoint me now. All right, let's do this. Okay. So the first question that's very important for this piece is what performance theory is. So performance theory is important for learning about what performance is. The beginning is very text heavy and then it gets fun. There's gifts and stuff, so get excited. So performance theory, generally framework associated with different types of performance. That's basically what it is, right? So we focus on the why we perform and how we perform. It was shaped largely by some guy named Turner and some other guy named Sheshner. Um, and they basically stated that understanding performance is, under, is crucial to understanding human behavior and human life. That is the purpose of this experience. Hold on, let me move y'all a little bit. I'm tall. Make you small. Sorry, Zoom. We're going to make you small for a second. Um, and so performance in general extends to everything and everyone. Um, but for the purposes of this, we're going to talk about two types of performance theory, Western performance theory and African performance theory. So continuing, Western performance theory, which is basically Europe, the United States, I mean, yeah, Canada, maybe, um, is linked to the concept, the French concept, la pour la, which means art for art's sake. And so this asserts that performance is the physical representation of art rather than an artful expression of life. So if you've ever heard the phrase, uh, truth is stranger than fiction, it's linked to that kind of concept that instead of believing the performance of general life, we are focusing on how art is beautiful and wonderful and has nothing to do with life. You're always performing for someone else, whether that's just for you, or that's for a huge audience or a classroom of dope students. And it is limited to beauty, which means when we give art to the world, we are not interrogating it for more than just beauty. We are grateful for art. We're so glad that it's here. Thank you, you're beautiful. And that's kind of it. That's Western performance theory. It, typically this happens when you are told to be quiet during readings. Does this sound familiar? Or you're supposed to sit awkwardly in the back and just like listen in complete silence while someone reads at you. Yeah, I don't do that. You're in a, you're in a, if you had, if I had been physically here last night for uh, Disha's keynote, you would have just heard me in the back be like, yes, yes. And I was doing it alone in my hotel room, which is like close, to, almost the same thing anyway. So that's Western performance theory. And if you can't tell, I don't really subscribe to that. So I subscribe more to African performance theory, which is linked to the concept of nomo. And nomo specifically means spoken word. And it asserts that performance is a spiritual force that alters all present, like all the people there in the shared experience. So you come in for different reasons, right? Some of you are here because they're all grad students, right? Is that right? So some undergrads, some of you are undergrads, some of you are grad students, some of you are just like folks who, love Sheila, like all kinds of people, right? And you all came in here for maybe different reasons, but being a part of the experience is going to shift you in different ways, but it's powerful enough that you'll all leave with a shift in your experience, right? So hopefully you left the keynote last night, right? 
having shifted some of your experience. You leave your workshops having shifted your experience. And that's the idea of NOMA, is that by engaging in an experience of spoken word, your life changes. In this theory, performance is the artful expression of life, which means that art imitates life and vice versa. And it believes in this fluid exchange. And this is where we come back to the idea of truth being stranger than fiction. Um, at Conversations and Connections, the last one in real life, <laughs> fall of 2019, uh, Robert Yoon talked about how being a fiction writer is super difficult right now because the world is like competing with the imagination of writers. Because it's like, you can't even believe what's really happening in the world. So how am I supposed to make stuff up? <laughs> and I laughed very hard when I heard that the first time. And that's kind of what uh, performance theory believes in, African performance theory believes in, is that you, know, you want to represent life through your art and vice versa. The oral tradition of the griot, which was an African storyteller or historian, also is part of this, because that is how we understand safe communication between enslaved people in the Americas. And it's also part of folklore. So if you ever have legends in your family, like some weird story that just keeps getting passed down, it probably gets more and more outrageous as the generations go down, right? Something that probably started off super simple. I have an NCIS example. If any of you watch NCIS, don't. It's a ridiculous show. But an example is, you know, some guy swallows his mother's engagement ring. Well, I don't know why people do that, but it happened. They take him to the doctor and they're like, oh, he'll just pass it. And he doesn't. And instead it just is in his small intestine and it's disgusting. So that story gets passed around, passed around, passed around. And as you hear more and more, you learn that the ring is like super expensive. It's got a diamond as big as your face. Like it's so ridiculous. So he gets murdered, obviously. I'm on a tangent now, but he gets murdered because of the story, because the guy wants the ring. Turns out the ring is fake. Right? And so, <laughs> but it's like this wild story that got passed down and passed down and passed down. And that's part of the understanding of performance, right? Is that you want to, in order to preserve life, you have to keep telling stories. Does that make sense? And that's why performance is important. So, why does any of this matter? That's a very good question. One, when we talk about performing our work, we have to, to think about why we're doing it, who it's for, and what we hope to accomplish by doing so. And if you were in my choreo poem class, I'd go on a whole rant about why it's very important that we talk about the issues that are happening in the world. And, you know, I quote Nina Simone a bunch and, you know, that's what we do. But that's basically for you to ask yourself every time you're performing a piece. Why am I doing this? Who is this for? What do I hope to accomplish? When those people leave the room, what do I hope from them? hope for them. And it could be something as simple as like, I really hope they buy my book and that's fine. That's totally fine. Or it could be something way more specific. Like, I really hope that they recognize that my speaker has, is representative of a group that is not frequently, whose stories are not frequently told. And then hopefully they go forth and they do research about that space and they meet more people who engage in that identity. Maybe that's what you want. So that's the first thing. Next, Recognizing that performance is an act of publication. And this is a little bit controversial because when we hear publication, what do we think? Print, yes. Text. I operate in rules of threes, I need one more. Social media, yes, it's everything. It's the act that means other people can see it, right? And so that doesn't necessarily mean once you perform a work, it is published. That's not the same thing. I mean that it's an act of publication, which means that it is in the world. You've moved it from the page to the stage. You've given your art voice. You are setting it free. You're giving it life, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever euphemism works for you to think about moving your space from, moving your artwork from in your head slash computer slash cloud to the world. That's the idea. And whether you believe in art for art's sake simply or the power of NOMO, just knowing why you're sharing your work with an audience is the, in the first place is very, very important. Why are you doing this? Always ask yourself that. And that's important because a lot of writers don't like giving readings. And this is something you'll notice the more readings you go to, because the ones who hate giving readings are horrible performers. Like they get up there and they're like, so, I mean, whatever, here's my book. They don't look at you. They're like talking to themselves. They're talking so low that you can barely understand what they're saying. Oh my God, that is like my biggest pet peeve. I cannot stand that. Um, anyway, so 
next. But Monica, I'm terrified to read my own work in public. Oh, never fear, friend. So is everybody else. Stage fright or the fear of performing in front of an audience is totally expected and it's totally normal. And even practice people like Jericho Brown, who won the 2020 Pulitzer in poetry, gets nervous. He posted this earlier this year. I'm giving a talk in the morning that I've given many times, but of course, I won't let that stop me from being so anxious I can't sleep. And he follows this up by saying, not being able to sleep the night before anything big has been a hallmark of my life. But my anxiety level is actually hilarious since there are so many more night befores than there used to be. Hallelujah, right? Like, oh, I'm so grateful for these opportunities, but oh crap, I'm gonna feel like this way forever. I really like that. I love, I love that quote. I also spent 20 minutes looking for it because I was like, I read that at one point. Love that quote. Because it's so important to think about because anxiety, nervousness, fear, they are totally normal and they pop up always. Even right now, as we're driving here, as I'm, I'm like, I am late. And I'm just like, oh, so nervous. I'm gonna have to talk about this thing that's really important to me and I'm late and I feel bad. But like now I'm up here and I'm like, let's do it. Because that's how I am. Because anxiety, nervousness, and fear, they're there to protect you. That's what they do, right? They pop up because they're like, if we do this, we'll die. It's really aggressive. My anxiety is super loud, says stuff like that, super rude. Um, and those are things that are meant to protect you. Similar to anger and fatigue also are meant to protect you. And if you want to talk about that, I have a whole thing about how anger is like a protective measure of the body. And we can talk about it later. And you might think that's gonna kill you. It's absolutely not gonna kill you. You're gonna read. It's gonna be fine. Then it's gonna be over. It'll be fine. It will not kill you. I wanna like assure you first and foremost. So it's important to know, this is actually very important um, to know the difference between stage fright and a panic attack because they feel very similar, but they're not the same. So symptoms of stage fright real quick, you know, the physical symptoms, you're sweaty, your heart rate goes up. You know, maybe you're like, oh, no. what if I trip and fall on my face? Like all this stuff, you know, you're like, oh, maybe I could just, eh. like when we went to the wrong campus, part of me was like, maybe we just bail. <laughs> and my partner's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> He's like, we drove four hours for, to bail? No, find the right address. And it was fine, right? And then it's over, right? Because once you do the performance, all those nervousness, like, why were you nervous? You know why you were nervous, but like then it's gone and then it's over. You don't feel that way anymore, right? Panic attack is a little different. I mean, it's kind of similar. You might also be sweaty. You're probably sweaty. Um, and you might feel sick and all that other stuff. This is serious, right? Like the panic attack is serious. And mostly because it also, it like, you don't really know when it's gonna end. It kind of ends when the panic ends. But that's how you know there's a difference. Because I used to work with someone in the educational department when I was an undergrad, and she had to throw up every time she had to give a public presentation. You know, you can't be a teacher. If you have to throw up every time, you know what being a teacher is? Being public all the time. You can't throw up before, you can't, like literally the professor was like, yo, I don't wanna crush your dreams. But like, you need to get this under control or you are not gonna get this degree. You actually, you'll get the degree, you will never get a job. Cause they're not gonna let you have your own private bathroom to Ralph in front of children, no. Anyway, these things are similar, but not the same. So please know the difference. And also the symptoms of a panic attack are also like kind of general cause everyone's are feel different. If you've never had one, yay, good. Don't even listen to this slide, move on. Okay, so. How do you embrace stage fright so you can still be awesome? That's the real question, right? So stage fright happens to the best of us, all of us, even performance coaches like me. And it's helpful to have some tips that will calm you down before you even take the stage, right? First one, this is always going to be one, breathe. Please breathe. And my therapist will remind you that deep breathing helps quell feelings of anxiety and stress in addition to knocking down your adrenaline a little bit. Right, because once you breathe and you're like, hey body, we're not gonna die. But I was like, all right, fine, <laughs> we'll see. And then it's fine. Additionally, avoid stimulants and depressants. So try not to drink a, like eight cups of coffee um, or slam a bunch of shots, or I don't know, do cocaine in the bathroom. Don't do those things before you do a reading. 
Don't do it because it's not 1962. We're not beat poets, it's not cute. Don't do it. But mostly because it exacerbates your anxiety. If you were like shaking before and now you're like, yeah. Can't remember my name, but I'm feeling good. Like that's not cute. You don't want that in your life. Reminding yourself again, this is not gonna kill you. Barring a freak accident, you'll read, they'll clap. And then you go home and you binge watch High on the Hog. That's it, that's all you gotta do, it's fine. And then also you can do what I do, gassing yourself up. Sometimes positive affirmations work. According to Gustin Burroughs, they do not work for people with low self-esteem, so don't use that. But forcing yourself to smile, twerking in the mirror, that's what I do. Um, and it's like aggressive too. I won't, I'm not even wearing high heels right now, but I, was, I put on the heels this morning. I was like, let's do it. We are gonna go. And it's great. Whatever makes you feel good. That's gonna make you feel like an empowered boss. Go forth, do that thing. And then go do your reading. So, all right, you trust me? Yeah, right, huh, huh, yeah. So how are you gonna prepare for this dope reading? Since you asked, we are going to do it. You ready? This is my favorite part of the presentation because there's lots of interactive parts. So let's go. Okay, first and foremost, you've accepted an invitation to read online or in person. So the question is like, well, now what, what do I do? This is just basic. You need to get information about your reading, okay? One, when is it? Like what day is it? What time is it? And what time zone is it in? That is important because I foolishly scheduled a reading on Daylight Savings Day with international contributors who don't practice Daylight Savings. So this poor, poor author pops up in the Zoom room an hour into the reading like, yo, am I late? Yes, and it's okay because what? So time and time zone, where it is, um, what time you need to be there, that's important. That's what call time is, that's a theater thing. What time do you need to be there? Do you need to be there early so that you can set up, et cetera, et cetera? Um, what kind of publicity is there? Like, how do I hype up this reading? How do I invite people? Or if you're not supposed to invite people, why? <laughs> um, and what the rules of engagement are basically, which is like, how long am I gonna read and all that good stuff. Um, thinking about what genre or type of reading they expect from you. Because typically when people ask me to read, they want me to either do a performance poem or just poetry period, right? But if they're like, this is actually an all prose event and we want you to read some prose, you got some of that? I'll be like, I mean, I'll find it. It exists somewhere. Um, if it's virtual or in person, if it's virtual, what platform are they using? Are they using Zoom? Are they using Google Meets? Are they using Kaltura? Are they using Teams? Are they using, I can like list 1500 other ones, but that's important because if it's something you've never used before, familiarizing yourself beforehand, always a good plan. You don't wanna be that person who can't figure out, find the mute button on Google Meets and you're just like, you know, your dog's in the background and you're just like, I don't understand. It's a whole thing. Don't do it. It's very stressful. Um, and then if you're doing it in person, what's the setup like? You know, is there a microphone? Is there a computer? Are you gonna be able to hold on to something if you get you know, emotional? Do you need wheelchair access? All that good stuff. Find out how long you have to read. <laughs> I asked Mila that on my way in here. I was like, I forgot to ask. And she's like, I got you. Um, how long do you have to read? Does that include introductions, saying thank you? Is there a Q&A? What is the code of conduct? What are you allowed to wear? Is this a family friendly event? Are you allowed to cuss? That's important because um, I write a lot about sex. Am I allowed to perform those poems about sex, right? Things like that. Um, am I allowed to be political at this event? And that's important, especially if you're giving readings for religious organizations or religiously affiliated universities. Like, am I allowed to talk the, about these particular topics? And if they say no, you might wanna say no to the reading and it's fine. Um, and then compensation, are they gonna pay you? Yay, if they are, dope, fabulous. If they're not gonna pay you, what other compensation is available? Are all your drinks comped for the night? Do you get a free hotel room? Are you, are they gonna like, you know, fly you out? Like if they're not gonna pay you, is there another type of compensation? I'm a big fan of compensating writers for their work. And it's fine if like, you can't do a lot. And it's also fine to say, oh, so there's no compensation, that's okay. I still wanna give the reading. You can do both. Um, and also, are you selling your books? Is someone else selling your books? Do you need to bring books? So on and so forth. So, all right. So now you need Monica's signature techniques for giving a spectacular reading. Are you ready? This is where all the, all the things come in. Okay, let's do this. All right, number one, practice. It is very important that you read your work before you get up on the stage because you don't wanna be that person 
okay, who's like never seen their work before. It's the first time they've printed it out in like six months. There's a comma there, I don't remember. You don't wanna be that person. So make sure you're practicing your work before you start it. Next. Can't emphasize this enough, practice. I yell at my seniors about this because they're like, no, I've read it a hundred times. I'm like, out loud? Why would I need to read it out loud? Because this event, shock, is out loud. So read it out loud, very important. So make sure you're practicing. It doesn't matter how you practice. You should, if you need to practice in the mirror, if you need to record it and listen to it while you're driving, if you need someone else to just sit there while you read, whatever you need to do, all right? Make sure you practice. Seriously though, practice. You don't wanna be that person. You gotta do it. You have to read it again. You don't have to memorize it. That's not important. But there might be inflections that you wanna use. You wanna make sure you nail them. There might be other types of things that you wanna be doing on like in the event that you may need to time, things like that. So make sure you're practicing because it's also important to time yourself and practice helps with that. Promise the fourth one is not practice. So it's really important that you choose work that you love, work that makes you happy. Because whatever you decide to read, we have to know that you like it because we can tell if you're reading a passage that you hate or a passage that's unedited or something you haven't read or performed in a while, right? You don't want to like, and I emphasize this because I had a, a senior a couple of years ago who performed a piece that everyone else really liked, but like they had given up on. They were just, I'm so tired of reading this piece. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't do it for me anymore. I'm annoyed, I'm bored. I don't wanna read it anymore. And they performed like super lackluster and everyone really loved it, but you could also tell from like, oh, I guess kind of wish I'd heard something else, right? So choose something that you really, really, really love. Next, make sure you time yourself. If your host gives you a defined amount of time to read, for example, if you're performing in a poetry slam, you have less than three minutes, right? Adhere to the time limit because everyone, Twitter, everybody will hate you if you go over your time. I don't know if any of you are involved in like writer Twitter and if you've ever seen like the fallout of people who just like blacklist authors who talk, who like read for 45 minutes when they're supposed to read for 10. Like I had a student years ago who had six to eight minutes and he read for 25. He was the first reader. There were seven people after him and they were so angry. They kept looking at me. I'm like, that's not even my student. Like I didn't even coach this person. It was horrific. Don't be that person. They will hate you and they will tell people. They will blast you. They might not say your name on Twitter, but they will say it in person. So don't do it. Make sure you slow down. I'm not doing any of that, obviously. I'm speaking very quickly. Um, but make sure you slow down and enunciate. This is important because when you are nervous, you tend to speed up and you tend to garble your words a little bit. Or if you're super nervous, you tend to get very, very, very quiet. And that's very hard for people to understand you because you're uncomfortable and you want to make yourself smaller. So don't do that. Slow down and practice enunciating. And then get loud. Oh, RIP Kobe. Speaking from your diaphragm, it allows you to project your voice. It's hard to project your voice frequently, right? It's a hard thing to do, especially if you're not someone who speaks loudly regularly. But the main reason is because technology frequently fails us. The microphone decides it doesn't like you or it runs out of batteries. Maybe the microphone you plugged in hates you, whatever. Maybe halfway through the event, the power goes out, but you got your phone, right? Let's do this, right? So you wanna be able to project your voice so that people can always hear you at any point. And being excited about your work helps with volume. Yeah, it's all coming together. So strategizing your performance is very important. So plan your reading as an emotional narrative. If you're reading more than one piece, we'll go specifically into that image in a second. Or choose performance pieces to manipulate the audience's emotions or their scores if you're at a slam. Uh, that's important because if your goal is to get up there, make a bunch of people cry, drop the mic and leave, do it. I mean, if that's the piece you actually wanna read. Um, but if you're trying to read more than one piece, you kind of have to be kind to your audience. Right, so we'll talk about that right now. So here's this little image. 
So I don't know if any of you know that, um, what's it called? There it is. Uh, the thing that they teach you in like seventh grade in the fiction, I'm doing this backwards, the fiction class, you know what I'm talking about? This, okay, whatever. So this is based off of that. So you start with the exposition, right? Which is basically, who are you? Why are you here? Say thank you for you know being here. I didn't do that. Thank you, Chatham, for having me. Appreciate you. And then you go into your first piece, you introduce it. Maybe you don't need to introduce it. This is not something that's required, but maybe you need to introduce it. So I typically encourage you to pick something high. And I say this, especially as a poet, uh, cause a lot of poets were just like, we're all dying, there's a tree. I hate us sometimes, um, but like, so I encourage you to choose something high. And the high thing can be something that's like exciting, funny, nostalgic, lighthearted, whatever, but it doesn't have to be happy per se, just like something that's higher in emotion, right? And then choose something a little bit lower. And this thing can be more serious. It can be serious, it can be traumatic, depressing, scary. I have a lot of students who write horror. So like this is pretty much what, where that goes, the horror genre right there. Then you have something that turns if you, you know, have these pieces and something that makes a good transition. So maybe you're moving from something that's intense content wise, and then you're moving into something that is more interesting form wise. And you'll hear me do this tonight when I switch from content and I focus on form, right? And then your final piece can be also something high, right? Intense, emotional, bold. This might be where you want people to laugh or you want people to cry at the very end, right? Maybe it has a wow factor. This is typically important if the very last line is something that makes all of us go, that's it? Right, that's the idea. And then, I think that's it. Ooh, I did it again. And then you have your conclusion, which you say, thank you so much, I appreciate this. Or if you're supposed to introduce the next reader, you introduce the next reader, so on and so forth, whatever you're supposed to do next. Also, this will be available. Joe will give you the, the PowerPoint. I would never like leave you abandoned like that. I would never do that. Okay. So this goes back to my point about using the stage or the podium, right? So if you're standing behind a podium and you're still uncomfortable, no one will notice your knuckles turning away if you're just gripping it while you read. No one notices, no one's paying attention because they're so enraptured with what you're saying. Um, and I have the leaning thing because my students will always joke about how we, we have like this very horrific podium that we always have them read behind and it's always on wheels and the brakes don't work. So I tell them don't lean too heavy on it because it'll go flying and it'll like nail our director of the Institute and it'll be a whole problem. And then we have to postpone the reading because he's in the hospital. Anyway, so like try not to lean on it if you don't know how sturdy it is, uh, but uh, don't be afraid to use it because it's there for you. Next, drink water. As my partner says, stay, hydrate or dihydrate, because um, water is your friend and dry mouth is your enemy. And if you don't drink enough water, that's exactly what will happen to you. And it's doubly important because if you're wearing a mask, you definitely need to find a way to drink some water. So, you know, drink some water. It's very important. The th a theater trick to uh, give you is to eat an apple about 90 minutes before your performance. It'll help clear out some of the like, you know, whatever's in your throat, and it also hydrates you passively because. There are a lot of, there's a lot of water in apples. So it hydrates you passively. And then you're not starving halfway through your reading because you've eaten something. This is very important. You wanna make sure that you anticipate your audience's reactions, especially if you're a comedy writer um, or if you're a horror writer. If you have like, if you write like really ex like expressive, intensely emotional pieces, um, people are gonna laugh, they're gonna gasp. If they're like me who engages with the reading, they're gonna like freak out. I remember one of the first times I saw the vagina monologues, there's a part where they say, they're it's, a, it's a part right before the uh, monologue flood, the flood. And the narrator says something in effect of, you know, talking to this 80 year old woman and she stated she'd never even had an orgasm. First time I heard that I was like, oh my God, I was in the front seat. <laughs> Distracted the actor so badly. I was just like, I, why, the, what? I was so horrified. And the, act, the poor actor, they were just like.
And then, and then they kept going, but like it took a second because I was like in my feelings, right? Um, and that's how I am at every reading. Like if you ever go to a reading with me, it's like, don't sit next to me, I'm loud. Like I just, I'm in it, I'm so in it. Um, but you wanna make sure you anticipate some of those moments um, and pause when people do that so that, you know, they don't lose a lot of your emphasis. This is important. <laughs> we wanna make sure that you are making eye contact. If you're reading from paper or a mobile device, um, make sure that you look up at your audience often, right? And if you're someone who can't keep track while you do that, make sure you like follow along. Woo. Make sure you follow along either with a pen or your finger to make sure you keep your place. Another way to avoid all this is to just memorize your pieces, but that's like really aggressive because I feel like there's lots of prose writers in here and y'all are like, you want me to do what? Yeah, you don't have to do that. It's not a requirement, it's fine. Um, but if you're reading online, like in a virtual landscape, make sure that you either print out your piece or you use a secondary device to read from. Because I don't know if any of you have noticed when you go to a virtual reading and someone is reading from their computer, the same one that has the Zoom room on it, their eyes kind of go dead as they're reading and they're not looking at you, but they're still looking at you. And it's super weird and uncomfortable. Um, a better way to engage with the audience is to read from something else so that when you look up, you're looking at that. And also that way, if you are in the Zoom room, the, the comments won't distract you uh, because people like to put in how much they love things, right? And it'll pop up. So this is a way for the comments not to distract you. Okay, we're doing great. Um, sometimes you need a persona in order to enter into the uh, performance space, right? So my persona is linked to the concept of high heels and hubris which means like almost every performance I provide, I wear high heels and I remind myself I'm the shit and it's great. And that's just how I live my best life, right? And it's a slightly separate per persona from like who I am regularly. <laughs> like I'm really aggressive and loud and like, I'm an extrovert. So I'm pretty much like this all the time, but um, my performance persona is like eight times higher than that. Um, so <laughs> good luck tonight team. It's gonna be gonna be a little ridiculous. Um, and so as long as you believe in your piece and you don't think about the sound of your voice, which absolutely will distract you and telling you not to think about the sound of your voice will make you think about the sound of your voice immediately. Um, but I'm telling you this passively and then you won't remember later and then you'll be fine. You'll totally be fine. This is important again. <sighs> Do not get drunk. Do not get high. Cause it's not 1962 and it's not cute. Okay, and I emphasize it specifically because this is how the beat poets operated, right? Allen Ginsberg and his friends would get drunk in a bookstore somewhere and they'd read their poems together and it was adorable and we call that performance and it's fine and it is performance. But the reason it's problematic now is that this contributes to the idea that authors are drunks and that our work is only inspired by hallucinations associated with alcoholism and drug abuse. That's not true. There are many sober writers and and I don't want you to assume that that's the only way that you can be fun and interesting and cool and that people will enjoy your reading. Cause it's not true. It's not true. It's just not true. Not true. Just enjoy yourself. And then afterwards you can do whatever you want because then it's over, especially if you're getting paid for the event though. Definitely don't get drunk or high if you're getting paid because then it becomes a whole thing and you get a reputation for not being professional. So just get your money and then use it at the bar. This is very important. Thank you, Sheila, appreciate you. Apologizing is something that we do out of a nervous habit. Next to Canadians, Americans apologize more than any other nationality in the world. It's one of the first things you learn when you learn another language is how to say, I'm sorry. Think about it. Go back to fifth grade, ninth grade. You're in that weird Spanish class. Even I know how to say, I'm sorry in Spanish. I speak French. Even I know how to say I'm sorry in Spanish, right? And we all know how. And the reason why is because we are uncomfortable. Add on the idea that femme identifying people apologize more often than any other gender identifying person. And we're not just apologizing for our bodies or our presence, we're apologizing for our existence. So when you get up on the stage and the first thing you say is, hey, yeah, I'm Monica, glad to be here. Thanks everyone. I'm really sorry about this, it's kind of rough. I don't care about what you have to say anymore because you don't care about your own work. You're apologizing for something I haven't even heard yet. I don't know what your work looks like. Make me decide that I don't like it later. But you got to read it first. So don't apologize. It's a, it's a gut instinct. 
to just say, I'm sorry, mm, okay, let me start over. And that's important too, because if you stumble, just take a breath and then read again. Instead of saying, mm, I'm sorry, or yeah, mm, woo, all right, all right, let's go. Like try to avoid those nervous habits. It will take a while. It takes a minute to be able to do it. It's gonna take a while. It's not something you learn overnight, but try to untrain yourself to apologize because unconsciously you're apologizing for even being there. And you got invited, we wanted you there, right? Everybody's there for you. So don't, don't apologize, avoid the, avoid the instinct. So you're supposed to enjoy it. Contrary to what this gift might suggest, um, you can still have fun while performing sober. And the best way to do that is to just enjoy the reading, be fully present in what's going on, engage with the reading, remember what's happening, be excited about the author. If they mention someone who sounds interesting, write their names down. If they talk about a class that they're gonna be giving in the future and you're interested in learning more, like pay attention in that way, engage in that way. Because A, it makes you a better audience member and a better literary citizen as a result. And B, it means that you're like not even that pressed about your own performance because you're so focused on being there right? Staying present is really, really important, which is difficult to do if you're drinking. So hence my point. All right. <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones. So whatever your dress code is, I encourage you to dress to impress, but be comfortable. Like you don't have to walk in six inch heels if you haven't worn heels in eight months. Like it's fine. So be comfortable, but like dress to impress a little bit. Or if you're more like me, dress to destroy. <laughs> Thank you for getting this because my students didn't get this. Um, and I was angry. I was like, this was so critical to my upbringing. Anyway, so dress to destroy. And by destroy, I mostly mean dress to uh, intimidate the other people. That's important if you're at a slam too, because if you're performing at a poetry slam, you want to make sure that all the other slammers are like, I'm a little bit nervous. I wasn't nervous before, but then they walked in the room. You see what they're wearing? Oh my God. I might not be able to pull this off. And you want that. Get in their heads. All right. You hear it? Do they hear it? They can't hear it? I'm so sad. Maybe it'll get louder. Nope, that's not it. That's not it. Anyway, it's playing applause by Lady Gaga, which is important because you want to enjoy the applause. I know that gif is not from the right video, but I couldn't find her actually clapping in the video. Kind of weird because that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Anyway, I think this is. All right, point is at a regular reading, like the one you're going to go to tonight, after your name is called, count to three. A, because it makes you breathe. And then you stand up and enjoy the applause. I'm the kind of person who claps all the way up to this podium. So I just wait, I don't care. I'll just keep clapping. If you're in the back of the room, I will do it all the way up because you deserve applause, right? Real world doesn't give you a lot of applause. Nobody claps for us ever, um, but it's okay because after your name is called, enjoy that applause because it's for you, enjoy it. And then, at a, if you're at a performance, at a, if you're at a slam, count to three also, because you wanna be able to absorb the power of the stitch. Because it's all for you. This is very crucial. So I was teaching a slam poetry camp in Houston, Texas several years ago, and I was teaching seventh to ninth graders. And there was a seventh grade student who was involuntarily enrolled into my class by his parents because they said he's too introverted, he's too shy. We think performance poetry will crack him out of his shell. And I'm like, or give him a complex. Okay. So, you know, I'm trying, so I do this thing with my students where I tell them all to stand together, right? And they have to get up on stage individually and they have to say their name. They have to say their title, which can be like, I'm in this grade or I'm the author of XYZ. And then they have to say, and I'm full of magic. So you get up on stage and you say, my name is Monica Prince. I'm a professor of activist and performance writing and I am full of magic. And then you have to pose, right? So it's usually pose, 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 right? And that's what you do. 
And the point of this exercise is to make sure that you are used to A, being up on the stage, but B, not being afraid to like declare that you are dope and you are awesome and that this space is yours, right? That's the idea. But you have to breathe through it, which was never something I felt like I needed to say before. I was like, obviously keep breathing. It's an automatic function, just keep doing it. So this poor child, you already know what's gonna happen. This poor child, last one to go, right? So we're all at the back of the room because we wanna make sure he's projecting. He gets up on the stage, he's like, okay. My name is William, I'm in seventh grade and I am full of magic and passes out. <laughs> and I'm, I'm first we're all like, oh my God. And like we had to run to the, I was so terrified I killed this child. I was like, oh, I mean, now he's dead. Like, oh my God. And he was fine. He passed out because he locked his knees and he stopped breathing apparently when he started. I don't know what happened. It was a whole thing. So like, make sure you're breathing. <laughs> That's my cautionary tale. Just make sure you're breathing and moving around helps because it forces your body to be like, oh, have we inhaled recently? Let's do it again. We like it a little bit. All right. And I think that's the last one. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Woo. There we go. Here we go. We did it. That was awesome. Thank you. That was awesome. Okay, because we are on Zoom, as well as in the room, we're going to ask anybody in the room who has a question to come up and speak it into the microphone. And if there are folks on Zoom who want to ask a question, throw it into the chat, and Joe will come up here and speak it into the microphone. <laughs> or you could see it. You could speak it. Is that okay with you? Okay. All right. So folks in the room, just come up if you have questions. I'll stand here. How about that? Come through, come through. Is she from here? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us who you are. Oh, sorry. What do you think? Oh, thanks. Sorry. Hi, I'm Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew. Great to meet you. Thank you. I have two questions. Yeah. One is a yes, no, and then one is a more questioning one. Uh, one, did the kid break out of his shell? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, is the question. answer for Zoom. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. He did a great job. He did a great job. It's awesome. Um, and then the second one is, uh, what do you think is like the role of silence or I guess quietness in performance? Like how can it be effective? That's a great question, Matthew. Appreciate that. Okay. So the role of silence in performance. I think silence is really effective, right? The dramatic pause. We all know the dramatic pause. Um, I think silence is super effective because silence allows us to contemplate what's going to happen next. And if any of you are theater performers, then you know that there's that moment where they build in beats into the script. And that basically means hold, let it sink in. In the Bible, I think it says Selah. I can't remember, I think that's the word. That's the word that they use in Psalms. It's Selah, yeah. That's the word they use in Psalms, which means pause, right? And so you wanna think about the importance of the pause. The pause is very, very, very important. I'm so sweaty. Um, the pause is very important because it allows you to breathe and it allows the audience to kind of get close to it. At slam competitions, they don't like the pause. They think the pause is you forgetting and they'll start filling the silence with snaps to encourage you. I hate that, I can't stand that. Um, because it's like, no, let me pause. Assume it's on purpose. You don't know what my poem is? Let me pause, right? And so I am a strong advocate of utilizing silence because I think silence has the ability to force us to really pay attention. Because people who zone out during readings, this happens to all of us, you zone out during a reading, um, especially if someone's speaking monotonously. So you zone out during a reading and then suddenly they stop talking and now you're like, what did I miss? Oh crap. And now you're paying attention again, right? So utilizing silence is important for that. You don't have to use it all the time, but use it intentionally and it's a good thing. Yeah, I'm gonna switch this to the chat. Okay. Yeah, oh, Deesha's here. First, I love you. Aww. Second, um, <laughs> it's a two part question. I'm ready. Where can we find videos of you performing? And who, who else's videos would you recommend that we study? as we practice. Thank you. 
That is a great question. Um, I have random scattered videos on the YouTubes where you can see me perform. My most recent performance, I think, was that that was recorded was probably in 2018 um, because I almost never record my performances, um, which is like a weird. I don't know what my life is like. I don't know, whatever. Um, but I so that's one thing. They're scattered around the YouTube. One the act. No, I'm a liar. The most recent is a poem I did for my university called Better. And it's about our COVID anniversary. It's the anniversary when we shut down our campus and went online and they had me write a poem for it. So I'm performing in that one. And that's on my website, monicaprince.com. And it's also on um, the Susquehanna University YouTube channel. It's on our website, it's on the board of trustees, it's on LinkedIn, it's on Instagram, it's on Twitter. You'll find it, just search Monica Prince better, it'll pop up. Um, so that's one of the most recent ones. Other people to study. I strongly encourage you to study slam artists because their whole job is being a performer, right? So, and they can show you how to perform from paper and memorized. So one of my favorite performance videos is the Ode to Whataburger by Amir Safi. So Ode to Whataburger, I don't know if any of you are from Texas, um, but the national chain there is national chain as if Texas is its own country. Anyway, the <laughs> massive chain there is Whataburger and they're constantly in competition with In-N-Out Burger, which is in California. This is only important if you care about the Southwest. Shouldn't, it's not very important. Um, anyway, so uh, Amir Safi wrote this poem called Ode to Whataburger and it talks about their ketchup. It talks about you know how they're open 24 hours. They serve breakfast 24 hours, like all sorts of stuff. It's literally, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful love poem to Whataburger. My favorite part about that performance, A, it's not, um, what's the word? It's not, it's not memorized. The poem isn't memorized. It's from a Texas Grand Slam, like 2014. And he's reading from a piece of paper, but there's a line he says, where he says, what a burger, you are the only place I've ever felt safe sitting next to a cop. And he steps back and just stands there as the audience explodes with clapping and applause because he knows he has to pause, right? Because he knows that's what everyone's gonna do, that they're gonna clap, they're gonna applaud. And so in order to do that, he just waits, lets them do that, and then he comes back to the mic. And that's why I love that performance, because it teaches you the power of silence and also the power of pausing, right? So that's one. Also, anyone who's associated with the Write About Now, W-R-I-T-E, About Now um, performance poetry space, they also run challenges on Facebook. So they do 30 for 30 challenges in April and random other months whenever they feel like it, um, where they give you about 200 poetry prompts over the course of 30 days. It's amazing and fabulous. Um, all of their performers are incredible. Chippy Ardunia, uh, Christopher Diaz, Anna Christina, Zach Blunt. Um, the other one whose name I cannot remember, RJ Walker. All of them are phenomenal performers and they perform at different levels too. They read off paper and they perform memorized. Um, Deaf Poetry Jam, which is a, flat, a blast from the past, early 2000s. Almost all of their videos are on YouTube. Watch them, they're fabulous, they're all incredible. And they include famous people like, you know, Alicia Keys I think does one, Jill Scott, uh, what's his name? Kanye West. So, uh, that's a weird one. He's got all these like suitcases on stage. It's kind of weird. Um, but, and then there's other like poets who you might not be that familiar with who perform um, or poets who used to be really big who aren't, you know, big anymore because, you know, they've got PhDs or whatever. And now they teach at a college somewhere. Um, things like that. Uh, those are my, those are the big ones I think of immediately. Deaf Poetry Jam, Button Poetry. They are rife with performance videos. It's what they do best. Um, yeah, all those things. But if you want someone to study who does what you do, who reads fiction, who reads prose, I would actually just like find out where your favorite writers are reading and just like pop into those Zoom rooms and listen to how they read. Um, Jericho Brown, who does read poetry, his performance persona is completely different from his regular persona. He gets really, really, really baritone and he speaks very slowly enunciates every single word. He's very intense. And then like his regular self is like, yeah, what's up? Like it's hysterical. Um, and so he's really good for that. He read an essay back in 2014 and he talked about that experience and it was just really fabulous. All right, Does that, does that answer your question, Disha? Mary states, what do you do if the audience reacts in an opposite manner than what you anticipated? That is a fabulous question that has happened. Um, I used to read a piece that, I had a piece called uh, Rules for the Wing Woman, which is, you know, gendered and not something I perform anymore. Um, and I think it's hilarious. 
not that hilarious. I've noticed when I read it, um, mostly because there is this sense that the audience recognizes that the speaker has a problem before the speaker realizes they have a problem. And I didn't know that, read this everywhere, didn't notice that until like an audience went silent at a part that I thought was funny. And I was like, oh, this needs revision. And I've went through the rest of the piece. You kind of just keep pushing through the piece. And it kind of, it's a, it's a note for you to be like, huh, I wonder why that audience reacted that way, right? One of the benefits is that your energy is infectious. So if you're super pumped about stuff, people typically get pumped about stuff as well. Also, if you give the audience something to do, like during the, the piece, then it allows them to react in the way you want them to react. Call and response pieces like that. Um, or if you give them something to do, like they have to track something through the piece, right? I typically give like audiences things to do during my work because I write in complicated forms. So I'm like, okay, you're looking for this. And then everyone just spends the whole reading like looking for the thing. Um, and so one way to address that sort of opposite reaction is to think about, is that me or is that just the audience, right? I'm thinking about comedy specials, right? The first person comes to mind is Eliza Schlesinger. And she has this joke at some point where she says something and the audience laughs and she says, I'm so glad that you laughed at that Chicago. South Carolina didn't enjoy it. And it's like, cause sometimes, you know, you have an audience that just is like, I don't know. Mm, we didn't enjoy that and that's okay. Sometimes that shows up because whatever you're reading might be problematic and you might be reading for the wrong space. Example, I performed a poem that's now called Successful uh, for Right About Now in Houston years and years ago. Come to find out the poem it's about is, was about one of the founders of Right About Now, which I didn't know. I knew she was associated with that community, didn't know she founded it. And I was like, oh Lord. And they loved it, like everyone really loved it. And they were all like super emotional afterwards. And then the post came up and said like, we're so grateful that you prayed this tribute to this, you know, this poet who we love. You know, actually her name is inscribed on the microphone. I was like, oh, you mean the microphone I was just speaking into? <laughs> Needless to say, I don't perform that poem anymore. Um, but like, sometimes you, you learn something, right? And that's important for you, that's helpful. So my biggest thing is to make a note and then revisit that later. Was that my fault? because I perform something problematic? Or was that just the audience? Especially if you don't train an audience how to, how to interact with you. Like if I walked in here and I was like super hype and y'all were just like in your, okay, we have someone at the front of the classroom. We are quiet. We are giving rapt attention. And then I didn't give you permission to like laugh and engage with me. Then I'd be like, am I not funny? I would have asked you point blank. I'd be like, I'm, am I not funny? I'm funny. I'm funny. And then I would have been doing that for five minutes. That's definitely something I do. So sometimes you have to like teach the audience <laughs> how to interact with you. And that can decrease some of the opposite reactions. I hope that's helpful, Mary. Yes, I'll repeat for you. Yes, you dear, purple shirt. There you go. All right, they're ready. So this is a weird question because I have no problem singing in front of lots of people on stage randomly. I'm petrified about reading in public and talking in public, even though I've taught before. So how do you translate that ability to just build out a song to actually being able to read? clarifying question. Are you singing your own songs or other people's songs? Usually others, I guess. Okay, that's, helpful. that's helpful for me. Okay, I got you. I got you. Okay, so how do you translate a different type of a stage fright that picks a genre? <laughs> that's rude, first of all, <laughs> that your stage fright is like, no, only when it's my stuff. Other people, let's go. Like, that's rude. <laughs> um, <laughs> So how do you translate a genre, uh, stage fright for a genre? So the biggest, that's actually a really great way to, to finish this talk. Um, so when you're dealing with the work of others, we typically aren't that pressed about our performance, right? Because it doesn't belong to us. It's not our little baby bird. It's not our baby bird. It's somebody else's baby bird. And it's not really anymore because it's out in the world and you're performing it. So instead, what, what I would help you think about is 
learning how to look at the piece that you're going to perform as someone else's. One way to do this is to print it out in a different font. This is a weird trick, it's a mind thing. Have any of you ever uh, revised in Comic Sans? Does it work? It's horrific that it works because it's a font that stresses you out, right? You're just like, oh my God, why? <laughs> um, and so that's really helpful. So that's one thing is to print it on, out in a different font because then it doesn't feel like yours, it feels like somebody else's, which actually might trick your anxiety into believing you're just reading somebody else's thing. That's one thing to do. Another way is to think about what, it, what is it really about performing your own work that makes you uncomfortable? Is it that it's yours? Is it fear of judgment? Is it fear of failure? Or is it something as simple as, I actually don't think this is done, which is fine. Because then what you are allowed to do is you can pick the part of whatever that piece is that you love, that you know is like finished, you know, that hard quotes finished, um, and use that as the way to enter into the piece and to give yourself some courage, right? One of the other ways to think about this is if the reason you're uncomfortable performing your own work is linked to a very specific past experience, like maybe something happened and you performed your own work and there was like a negative thing and it stressed you out and now it's haunting you, doing something that kind of clears that energy for you. Whether that's entering into a persona, I'm gonna reference NCIS again, where uh, Dornigate becomes some version of Leroy Jethro Gibbs in order to be cool, confident, and brilliant. And it helps him handle difficult situations. Or if that means thinking through, what is it because I'm reading nonfiction and all these people are gonna know everything about me, even though you're writing in a genre that means that other people are gonna know things about you. Um, and you're like, well, I wanna give it to people, but I don't wanna say it, right? Or if it's because you're concerned about the ways that Marginalized identities frequently when they're performing, the assumption is what we're doing is always anthropology while everybody else is allowed to just read and it's never them. This is something that's problematic for poets is when you have a first person speaker, everyone assumes you are the, the poet, you are the speaker of the poem. Similar if you have first person narratives in fiction or nonfiction, they always assume it's you. And that might be what makes you uncomfortable. But thinking deeply about what it is that actually makes you uncomfortable and then identifying it and then using it against itself. Being like, okay, so I'm reading this nonfiction piece about me and all these people are gonna know about that first time that I kissed that guy and it was awkward. And you're like, okay, well, what is, what is this actually about? Is it because I'm uncomfortable with this situation? Why did I write about it then? Or is it because that person's gonna be in the audience and I didn't ask permission to read this piece? Or is it, this isn't done and I really don't wanna read this piece. Find a different piece, that's typically the answer. Um, thinking deeply about what it is that is making that anxiety pop up for you and then addressing it in multiple ways. You can do it in multiple ways. I hope that's helpful. Is that helpful? Okay, good. Did I get that? I think we're out of time. Oh, you're totally out of time. All right. Monica, thank you. That was awesome. Okay, we're gonna wave goodbye to Zoom. Bye Zoom. We'll see you later.